Okay, next talk will be from Peter Koch. Uh, he is uh, he is uh, Denix senior policy advisor, and he will uh, have a talk about a wider shade on DOA DNS over HTTP. Peter. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? That seems to be the case. So I now have the interesting pleasure to be between you and lunch, and also to take you after all these talks about. Um, sorry. Okay, so there's somebody else to cool down this. That's great. Um, still, I also have to take you up a few layers because we've uh, heard so many talks about um, the physical layer and BGP and so on and so forth. We are going up a few layers, up until including layer nine, um, politics, finance, religion. You know this uh, extended model, right? So. First of all, DNIC as a top-level domain registry, we usually don't run resolvers, at least uh, not for external parties. We, of course, run them for, for our own use. Um, so we could actually lean back and look at this and try to have a neutral position. And that's also what I tried, but it's hard to be neutral in this case. Um, but then I leave the emotions to the audience and you can fire at me after, after the talk with questions and uh, contributions. So just to collect everybody uh, where they are. So um, the usual model, we're talking about the DNS, we're talking about DNS resolution. Um, things happen on the device. Different devices, you see them, your smartphone, your laptop, your something, Raspberry Pi, you name it. Um, with different resolvers, we have a stub resolver that is a stupid one that can only packet domain names into packets and send them to another resolver, the recursive resolver, that actually can go out to various authoritative servers to collect the information, compile the response, and hand it up to the application. Um, so that's one model. The other is, that's probably more known, you have a resolver on your CPE device, this type or any other one. Um, we just kind of concentrated already in the home or we have another uh, approach that is the resolver at the ISP. Oh, ouch, what's happening? Um, so you see, now there is this nice, here we go. Um, so there are these nice excerpts from both Heiser and Golem over the course of this and I think the previous year. Things happen there, so why do resolvers at ISPs make the news? Because resolvers are forced or convinced or asked by courts to interfere with DNS resolution, um, to block certain content, or to block at least block certain sites. Um, discussion about this, at least in this country, is as old as dating back to the, what, late 90s or something. Uh, different purposes, different entities requesting this, but that's still, still ongoing. Um, and of course, not only in Germany, but worldwide, and a bit more here and a bit more there. Um, that's one aspect to keep in mind. Okay, if you have a resolver, then you might be targeted asking, uh, might be targeted to change the information that you're actually supposed to deliver to the uh, customers, the resolver clients. Um, and that means the DNS is, of course, even if it wasn't designed to, a, uh, is used as the control plane for content regulation. That's the big thing, of course. And uh, if you followed the news, um, if you didn't follow the news over the last couple of months, you were on a different planet and enjoyed life maybe. But if you're following the news, there's lots of things that are coming up, like terrorist content and harmful content and so on and so forth. And here and there, there's always the DNS involved in one way or another. Um, so that's, that's to the thing to keep in mind um, when it comes to that centralized uh, way. Now, what has been what has been around for a while as well, and you all know that, that's the so-called quads, like the 8.8.8.8s and the 9.9.9s. So the resolution providers that didn't exist in the beginning, but that came up, Google started this with their quad 8, we have quad 9, we have quad 1, and we have others like uh, OpenDNS. And OpenDNS is a uh, resolution provider that, uh, at one of those, it's, I'm just taking it, not, not marketing it, but just taking it as an example, um, one of those resolution providers that add additional services on top of the resolution, which includes kind of filtering, because there are two ways of filtering. One that we saw um, in, the, in the headline news that is demanded by external parties, but then there, as you also know, there's a lot of filtering going on to mitigate uh, access to malware and other unwanted content, and we'll get back to that in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, so these came up. 
Um, and also, uh, yeah, you've seen the consequences that maybe customers uh, bypass your own local resolution infrastructure. Some ISPs actually don't run their own resolution infrastructure anymore and uh, move, move it away. Anyone here who is a, running a, a, an ISP network, maybe a small ISP network, and is just using Google's resolvers? Anybody not shy raising their hand? I can't see that side. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, so that's the other part. We know the filtering part, we know the centralized part, we have these big resolver engines, the big uh, Anycast clouds for that. Um, and then there's this, okay? Um, that's a very iconic photo. Uh, the picture is, I think, five and a half years old. It dates back um, to 2014 when there were Facebook um, blocks ordered in Turkey. And what happened was that people sprayed it on the wall, like the Quad 8 again, to um, help, quote, quote, the internet users in that country to still get to um, Facebook or any other um, uh, DNS name that was intercepted or, or um, redirected um, by means of using the Google DNS. So there is a promise there implicitly that these big resolution providers would be exempt from that kind of regulation or force uh, to do the blocking because, of course, all the ISPs in that country uh, didn't probably have a choice uh, other than following the orders that came from either the government or from the courts. So that's the other thing. Apparently, these big companies, probably the big US companies, um, yeah, are believed to be exempt from this or immune to, to that kind of regulation. Um, so this is a very simple picture. That's uh, something from a center paper. Center is the uh, European uh, organization where all the country code top level domains uh, join and talk about both techniques and politics. And since we try to inform the discussion also in, in Brussels, we came up with a, with a document. And this is just stolen from there because I was too lazy to draw my own pictures. And actually, I'm bad in drawing that. Um, so what we know is, or what we usually have is uh, the end system. We have an ISP resolver. And all the black or blue traffic here is unencrypted. And it goes out to the internet to the authoritative service as you know it. Um, and it can, of course, be intercepted or read whenever you are on the wire. Um, anybody remember this? Or this guy? Back then, when the NSA revelations, or the so-called Snowden revelations, were rather fresh, there was a lot of outcry in the technical community that um, all this interception was going on, or eavesdropping was going on, packet sniffing, and so on and so forth, to um, to engage in pervasive monitoring, as the ITF called it later, and other people did. And um, in, uh, in this case, the IETF, and you see a couple of, couple of RFCs here, the pervasive monitoring is considered a threat. That was one of the, not really a constitutional document, but a very strong political statement from that uh, standardizations organization, saying that, well, after these experiences with what we've uh, seen, um, the, uh, the services and the intelligence services all over the planet are doing, um, as a standards organization, the ITF would address this and uh, try to mitigate that in the protocol design. And subsequently, um, the ITF went through all of their protocols and looked where encryption was not mandated, where encryption was probably missing. And um, so sooner or later, they ended up at the DNS because, as you know, DNS runs over UDP, has no encryption. Um, we have DNSSEC a bit, but that's a different story. Maybe another dystopic talk. Um, and uh, so the ITF worked, uh, worked on this. And uh, more cowbell, by the way, was a program that was explicitly designed to gather intelligence out of DNS traffic. So this was not just paranoia. It was uh, following kind of a playbook um, to address a, uh, a program that had been actually um, revealed and was not just made up by, by crazy engineers. So we have the... Um, the various documents that uh, led to this, there's a distinct anal analysis of what the privacy of the DNS means. Um, before the NSA revelations, most people thought, well, you know, the data in the DNS is public anyway, um, so why bother? Why encrypt it? Well, obviously, the data in the DNS is public as long as you know what to ask for, but the fact that you ask a certain name at a certain point in time and get a certain response back, that's probably not what you want to be in public. And the 
one of the examples is the anonymous, uh, the Alcoholics Anonymous, or whatever site you're going to, whatever you do, a name you ask for, that might actually reveal some information about you that might be interesting to other parties and maybe not parties that are most friendly to you. So that's that's the idea behind that. Um, so now that the, the the documentation about what the privacy is, privacy issues should be um, was there. And uh, the question was, so how, how to change the DNS? What to add to the DNS um, to make this more, well, privacy friendly? And that means add a bit of confidentiality first. Um, and what every good standardization organization does is um, it comes up with a couple of standards so that people can choose from. That's also an old rant. Um, and what happened in the, in the IETF was actually uh, not exactly um, what, what is on the screen here. But there were two standards developed in a working group that had been uh, set up, I think, like four, maybe four years ago, the DNS Privacy Working Group in the ITF. And they worked on both DNS over TLS, um, which is inherently, of course, TCP, and also DNS over um, DTLS. Uh, the latter didn't get uh, very much traction, so let's focus on the DNS over TLS here. Um, that faced, of course, lots of skepticism from operators because everybody knew that, yeah, DNS has to run over UDP because otherwise performance breaks down. Um, and then there were measurements done, experiments, and so on and so forth, and uh, the TLS thing was, um, was developed. However, that's, that's an addition to the protocol that is only applicable, of course, to uh, the network between the resolver, mostly the stub resolver, and the recursive resolver. It's not about the resolver talking to the authoritative service because that would be a bit more tricky. Talking to my resolver, I have a pre predetermined connection. You usually know, well, you actually do know who the resolver is, but it's more important that your machine knows who the resolver is. So there can be a pre-established trust. You don't necessarily know which authoritative servers your systems have to talk to, and they change over time, and there are so many millions that uh, a system that would actually be able to usefully um, encrypt the traffic would involve a what? Probably a public key infrastructure because you need um, key exchanges and so on and so forth. And after that great experience with how DNSSEC was well deployed over the planet, um, the uh, the ITF working group abstained from that a bit, and it's not really, um, this is currently also not really motivated to go that way, but more of the information that can be gathered, of course, is in the traffic between uh, the end system and the recursive resolver. So that's why they constrain themselves to um, protecting that first mile between the end user and the, re the recursive. Now that worked, uh, worked well, there was uh, lots of technical discussion and details and so on and so forth, quite a comprehensive document that, that uh, was um, put into the standards process and actually published in uh, May 2016. So it's quite a while and you see some deployments, well, you see implementations in the major um, resolvers and quite some deployments. But then what happened? Um, there's also this other side, the web people. And while it was an engineering joke that anything would eventually end up being tunneled through HTTP or HTTPS, of course, in these days, um, most people hadn't really seriously thought of that until it happened. So the bright idea was, why? Why don't we just put the DNS messages into an HTTPS stream um, so we have all the encryption that we have? And because we are browser people and all we do is JavaScript, this also helps us to mitigate a couple of other problems. Be uh, namely, we can, access, uh, we can access the DNS much better than through these old-fashioned DNS libraries. We can do what we would, would always do in JavaScript, and then talk to some other end at the other side that will deliver us DNS messages over HTTPS and HTTP2, uh, of course, um, so we get, uh, get much better. We, we feel much comfortable because we are staying in our, in our own environment, so to speak. So that is a, well, it's a 20 pages document, but mm, a third of that is, is references. So essentially 10 pages that describe how the DNS message looks in HTTPS, no big deal. Um, of course, like the, the gray-haired part will, will cry layer violation, like we have uh, IP, the DNS, HTTPS, and then of course we have the DNS on top of that. That feels a bit weird engineering-wise, but then why not? Everything is going through HTTPS anyway. Um, and this is where we are. 
in a way, this HTTPS part, the DOH part, as opposed to the DOT part that was uh, DNS over TLS, the DOH part bypassed not really the, um, uh, the, the, the standardization process. Both went through that, but of course, for DNS over HTTP, there were big players around that had the power and opportunity to actually deploy it in the field. And you've heard about Firefox and Chrome. Um, Firefox cooperates with Cloudflare, so the browser vendor decides, or is in the way of deciding, that DNS resolution is no longer going through the, um, the end system to the operating system, or something that we earlier knew as the operating system, but it is going uh, out to some DOH server encrypted over the DNS. And it is going to be a DNS, a DOH server of the browser vendor's choice. At least that's version zero. Um, and we need to distinguish here between the technology that the ITF standardized, that is how to pack DNS messages into an HTTPS stream, and the deployment model, which is what the browser vendors came up with, kind of independently with some being earlier than others, but generally um, driving this towards more concentration. Okay, and here's the change picture, of course. You see now the encrypted part in red. The DOH resolver in that model resides outside the ISP's network. Um, so that's the uh, interesting and obviously challenging part, which um, faced so much opposition in some countries, at least from uh, ISP organizations and so on and so forth. And I guess we'll get to that. So, bigger picture. Um, DOH, as I said, does not dictate a certain deployment model, but it makes it so much easier to actually roll it out in the wild if you control the browser and then make friends with a DOH provider. You can roll it out to um, your, your test customers, and Firefox mentioned that or started that in September, October, to a certain percentage of the US customer base. They rolled out the um, uh, DOH uh, the name resolution uh, for, for Firefox. Um, Google is working on this, other browser vendors are working on that. Uh, we don't really know what, what Apple does with Safari, but it, sooner or later they, they usually follow what, what the others do. Um, so we can observe this development towards concentration. Again, that is not necessarily completely new because we already saw that there were emerging big resolver um, providers like the Quad 8, Quad 9, Quad 1s, but now this goes nice, nicely together. Um, this name resolution as a service did exist, but together with the browser vendors that, that help, in, in quotes, add customers, and also adding this resolver choice per application rather than per operating system or per, per, per engine, um, that's, that's really um, accelerating the concentration and is make, giving the, um, the resolver operators a certain power that they didn't have before. The DNS resolution was highly decentralized. There was no, no association of all the resolver providers in the world that would go to the authoritative providers and demand certain things or suggest things, right? Quite to the contrary, whenever the ITF worked on um, DNS and DSO and DNS operations, uh, there was a big problem to actually find out what the resolvers do. And in hindsight, that probably was kind of a good thing. Um, now with the concentration, there's of course a shift there where uh, big players um, can in inform decisions in a way that is kind of unprecedented, at least in the DNS. So um, what's the gain here and what are the promises? Remember the picture with the quad eight on the wall? So both DOH and DOT provide privacy. And now we need to distinguish. First of all, they provide confidentiality because the traffic is encrypted. But privacy, at least in the American sense, means a bit more than just confidentiality. It also has this connotation of being left alone, not being bothered. And that part um, goes in the direction of uh, what resolvers do. And obviously, in some countries, probably not so much in Germany uh, and, and the rest of continental Europe, but in some countries, it's quite common that ISPs engage in so-called annex domain rewriting. Like, so if, if a domain name doesn't exist, well, why don't we just present something else to the customer, uh, maybe a, an advertisement page, and so on and so forth. And this is actually what's happening. Um, rumors say that's also happening in the UK, but I'll get to that, that in a second. So. 
we now have the we now have the path between the end system and the resolver encrypted, but we have a centralized resolver. So instead, somebody listening to the line, they can't read anything anymore. The resolver providers see all the queries. Well, they did that before, but again, there was a highly distributed crowd, right? An ISP here, an ISP there, and now we have this very, very much centralized. And the interesting part is how do the resolver providers now deal with the user's data? Can they, can they um, fulfill their promise that they are not going to um, either exploit that for marketing purposes or hand that over to intelligence services if they are forced to do that? Um, so the interesting thing is the DNS resolver policy and um, who is going to, um, to dictate that or to, to um, inform that. Mozilla has come up with a program, they call it the Trusted Recursive Resolver Program. After they found out or faced the opposition, um, for their sole cooperation with one provider, namely Cloudflare. Um, others said, well, we need to have our own um, resolver. And they said, okay, technology-wise, that's no problem. As I said, technology doesn't dictate the deployment model, but if you want to be a resolver provider, you need to adhere to certain policies, especially you need to prom promise that you don't do uh, certain things with user data. Um, it's interesting that now the browser vendors are a gatekeeper for privacy. It's not completely unprecedented. The browser vendors have a big role in the CA browser forum, for example, thus the name. Um, but it's interesting from a regulatory perspective to actually look at what are they um, trying, to, um, trying to do with their market power. So the other part is that, that not being bothered, being left, alone, uh, being left alone. There are a couple of aspects to the filtering, right? So we have mandated DNS filtering that is usually not with the consent of the user. Some, some court or some government decides that users shouldn't see something in particular and then orders somebody to suppress the DNS resolution. Well, we all know that this is easily circumvented either by using some of the non-blocking um, uh, DNS resolvers or by doing it yourself with a, uh, with a tool, with a web tool, with an app, or by if you're really into it, uh, command line interface and doing a dig and using the IP address. Um, nonetheless, there is a strong belief by governments and others that this filtering is really, really effective and efficient. Um, it's kind of the emperor's clothes thing. So that is there. That's probably going to be there. There's also the opt-in filtering that is um, really with the consent of the user in normal circumstances, blocking malware and uh, advertisements and so on and so forth. And this thing in between which is nicely called parental controls. So it addresses the emotions in the debate. How can you dare that parents cannot decide what their kids got to see? Well, it's not necessarily a parent. It could also be um, your, your employer and so on and so forth. And I'm not questioning the legitimacy of this, but it's, it's very important to see that the emotions are addressed very easily here. And this thing in between is that, yeah, kind of with consent, the filtering, but not necessarily with the subject of the filtering. So again, this is all easily circumvented, but there is this, this well, it's not even a consensus, but this political thing that, that uh, blocking is important. Now, remember the picture with the quad eight and remember that concentration. The interesting question is when the browser vendors promise, and that's part of their story, that we will circumvent censorship with this. So it's no longer only about encryption and confidentiality. We will circumvent censorship with that. Does anybody believe that the browser vendors, uh, sorry, that the resolution providers can withstand the regulatory pressures that come from, um, come from all this? Probably, probably not so much. Um, GDPR and Google and others might serve as, as counter examples. And then there's NX domain rewriting and I guess I mentioned that already. So another interesting thing. Not, not looked at very often, but uh, again, interesting privacy aspect. So some content delivery networks try to optimize the delivery of content by means of DNS, giving different DNS responses depending on where you are. Now, the first thing was when people started to use the Googles and the Cloudflares of the world that everybody seemed to come from a different AS than they were, and they were sent in a different direction, and CDNs were performing worse. Then somebody invented eDNS client subnet and added that to the DNS. Like, so my DNS resolver now doesn't only ask for a response, it also tells the authoritative and others which IP address range I come from. 
not necessarily very privacy friendly. Um, if you compare that, however, to what the DOH resolver now sees, because my um, system, my browser is directly talking to them, they don't only, do not only see the uh, address range I'm coming from, they see the very address I use. So it's probably even worse unless you can fully trust the resolution provider. By the way, this also gives them a very interesting advantage to somebody running a CDN and a DNS over HTTP server at the same time, because they now they can ideally completely tell where the user comes from and send them uh, in the right direction. And if you compare that to the competitors who don't, do not have that opportunity, that gives an interesting um, economic and technical advantage, actually. So, interesting question is, one of these many interesting questions, what do we do? Um, do we need more DOH resolvers to get away from this, this concentration? Because um, monopolies are bad and oligopolies are probably not, uh, not much better. So let's give users a choice. The user should be able to, to configure this and do it in a way. Um, that's an interesting concept. I believe most people in this room would be capable of doing that. Question is, would everybody be interested to change their resolution provider? Um, but if we're talking about end users out there, this is probably going to be an illusion. Unless somebody else is again taking the decision for the end users, and that's, uh, that's an interesting discussion to, to continue. Um, how to select the DOH resolvers? Now, a config option for the end user, we, we just agreed, well, you didn't oppose any, at least, we, we just found out or agreed that, well, probably not really going to work for, for the average user. However, it could be the enterprise. The enterprise that sets a config option. There's no DHCP option yet, but something else can be worked on. That's a technicality. But that would, of course, go just against the, the, one of the basic ideas that ISPs are intervening with uh, traffic. And if the same ISP would now be, quote, quote, allowed to tell the browser to just use their own recursive uh, DOH resolver, um, this whole promise about blocking and filtering would no longer be fulfilled. So that's a complete mixed message. And again, the regulatory target might be even more interesting because now governments don't have to go to like 5,000 different ISPs, but can go to that dozen maybe that, that emerges as central resolution providers. Um, here's another policy question. And now we're zooming out a bit again and be with me coming from the, from the DNS world, from, we, we're interested in the namespace governance. And um, if we assume a group of cooperating DOH resolver providers, um, and then there might be a dominant internet service like the web, right? Nothing else is being talked about. We're only talking about the web browsers at the moment. Um, and there might be some interest in different namespaces or alternative resolution paths. Don't know how many of you followed this discussion about the .onion top-level domain, which actually isn't a top-level domain, but is used to um, describe a namespace that is used for Tor browsers. Uh, at some point in, in time, this .onion uh, was reserved not to become a top-level domain ever, and now you can um, use that in Tor browsers. But of course, if the web browsers vendors would, would find this or other approaches interesting, they could by themselves, by cooperating among that small group, could add things to the namespace that would not be available over the DNS, but would very much look like domain names and also would then um, prevent anybody else from actually using those names or giving them away to others. Um, in essence, the, the interesting question here is, what is the role of ICANN, so to speak, um, with respect to de determining um, what goes and what does not go into the DNS root zone? Um, so, final slide. We've seen a concentration that is, again, not unprecedented. Uh, this promise that everybody's going to talk to everybody on the internet is long since gone. We are mostly access, access to content. That's, that's the big thing here and um, has been mentioned a couple, couple of times. You go to any of the presentations that Jeff Houston has given at, at various occasions, you'll hear that in a more and more um, eloquent manner. But this is, of course, on the horizon for the DNS as well. Um, look at the email world. Again, this promise that everybody can, can hook up a, a mail server and send and receive email. 
Works nice in theory, not so much in practice anymore because of operational hurdles, written and especially unwritten rules. Um, now what we see here is that uh, with the concentration of resolution providers, it's not completely out of thought to believe that the resolution providers will go to talk to the authority providers and say, pre-negotiate encrypted traffic and, and do things here and there to optimize, uh, optimize the DNS traffic. Same way that happened in the email world and that leaves, it, uh, leaves the entry, uh, sorry, the threshold to entry much, much higher than before. And that is not necessarily a good um, development, but that's for you to judge. Um, another interesting point is looking at the performance um, TCP, UDP, TLS. They're rather fresh. A couple of weeks ago, a number of interesting presentations that people have really looked at how bad is TLS performing in comparison to UDP, and it probably isn't. But then again, if we compare DOT and DOH, like the both encrypting um, approaches, it's not necessarily the case that DOH always wins, but that's, that's uh, subject for further research. And I should mention DNSSEC at some point, um, which I haven't because DNS, uh, DNSSEC and this encryption are orthogonal concepts. But um, this uh, DOH and also DOT do not provide um, origin authentication, which only the DNSSEC part does. But this is rarely looked at. So we'll get an encrypted DNS with DOH where the origin authentication is probably, continue, uh, probably continues to be missing. Anyway, more, more open question than anything. Um, I hope I don't you leave you completely in the void. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Peter. Um, any questions? Everybody. Ah, the looks room. Oh, no. Oh, what? <laughs> Lutz Dornhage for the record. Danke, Peter. Um, question is, how will public VLANs survive if they redirect to a page by initially faking the DNS response in order to bring their people to a login page? Um, so that's... Yeah, that's two questions in one, right? The, the, the one is, what is this splash, splash page thing? What, what is the future of that? And how does that relate to, um, to the interaction? I'm really glad that you brought it down to a real operational question and getting away from the politics. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there is a working group in the IETF that, that specially deals with captive portals, um, completely unrelated to this DOH stuff. Um, the signals I receive is that they are working on things. I have no idea how, how the deployment is, but that is something that is dealt with on a separate basis. Um, but the signal uh, or the, the message that you send is, yeah, there are some, some operational scenarios that will break. The other operational scenario that usually breaks with uh, DOH is if you have a split brain DNS. So you have your own namespace inside the company and you provide a usually restricted part of the namespace to the outside. If you go outside to ask about names on the inside, you, you are in for surprises. So usually it doesn't work. And then there again is, is work on the way to add kludges and put in hooks so that you have an exception list and so on and so forth. Uh, I'd like to add on, on the split DNS. Um, there is a business model for Cloudflare. The, uh, if you want, and if you have the problem with DOH and uh, split DNS, go to your Cloudflare uh, account manager and ask them how much it is to uh, bring your own clients back to your own DNS. The offer is a paid service. Yeah, but then in all fairness, thanks, thanks for that additional info, but in all fairness, that, that's, they are not the only resolution provider. Others might follow that idea or have different solutions, but that's up for the browser vendors to, um, to actually address. Thank you. Any more questions? Probably not. Okay, then I have one. With all the success they have now with the DNS over HTTP, we will see more protocols um, going the OH way, like BGP over HTTP or SMTP <laughs> over HTTP. So th these guys, these engineers, have had huge success with this technology. So why not? Why stop here? Why not go on? 
So, so there is an interesting discussion also going on about BGP over encrypted uh, channel. Whether or not that makes sense to do it over HTTP is, is another thing. One of the promises in DOH, um, in the HTTPS part, is also that, and I didn't mention that so far, that you cannot distinguish the DNS transport from, from, from other transport. Um, and that would probably not be so important for, um, for BGP. Uh, other things, I don't know. But the, interesting, the other interesting aspect is that the application is now doing the DNS resolution. What part of the infrastructure is next? Are applications going to ask, is every application going to ask their own time server? Because they trust the time from their own vendor more than they trust something else. So the whole concept of having control over a system by means of the operating system, that is fading away and that should be of concern to operators, of course. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you.